Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Natatorium Knowledge. I'm your host, Eric Knight. And today we have a special guest, Steve Crocker. He's been on a few other videos of ours, but he is a very qualified competitive swimmer. And he's been one of the leading designers in the world uh, of natatoriums and, well, outdoor swimming pools too, just competitive swimming pools, water parks, everything. And he's a great resource. So he's going to be our subject matter expert today. Steve, thanks for being with me again. Thank you, Eric. I'm looking forward to our conversations. Should be lively. What's fun about this is he doesn't exactly know what's going to be asked of him. And uh, here it is as, as a design professional, Steve, what are some of the top mistakes to avoid for somebody who is about to build or design a new swimming pool? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, building the wrong pool is the number one thing, Eric. You know, a lot of, a lot of facilities are, are built and they're not thinking about how the pool should operate efficiently. Uh, they're not thinking about how the pool could be built to, you know, appeal to people of all ages. You know, maximize participation is really, really a key to success of a pool. Believe it or not, I've seen high school pools where the swim team uh, had, had all the input. No one ever brought the physical, you know, the PE teacher in to say, what do you need? And what happened was this is, a, this is an all deep pool built. For a high school, you really can't even teach swimming in it. So that pool had very little value for the community, and 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 it's so it's just a swim team pool. And and because of that, that pool has really really struggled to make ends meet, you know, financially. So you really need to be thinking about maximizing the usage of that pool from from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. And that's really really important. And um, and sadly, well, sadly from a competitive swimmer standpoint. Um, you have to compromise on things in, unless you're going to be hosting the big championships. And let's yeah. be honest, those are primarily held at big venues already with a 50 meter pool. Yeah. Uh, you have to have a shallower area. You have to have perhaps a ramp that can allow disabled people to get in for mm -hmm. ADA compliance. Those lifts are fine, but the ramps are great for especially kids learning or the zero entry. There can be a lot of mistakes in pool design and most of those mistakes cost money to fix. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say the designer specified a, a pump that just didn't hold up to this environment or, you know, someone put lights over the water instead of over the deck. And, you know, there's, those things are, are, you can deal with them over time and, and they're fixable. The things that are really, really unfortunate, Eric, are things that last for the life of the pool. Things that are perhaps unsafe or, or affect the performance are really, really, really critical. You know, like you know, a HVAC system that's, you know, you don't get good air circulation here. That could be addressed. And, and, you know, it's, the, oh, it's really costly it's to, to address, change mechanical equipment. Really, really costly. Um, you know, let's say that you designed a pool that's got deep water right next to the, you know, the locker room, instead of coming out of the locker room where the shallow water is, you come out and there's the diving boards. You know, that's a safety issue. There's a lot of things like that. that are safety issues that you just can't, you can't fix over time. Let's say, yeah, let's say you're designing a pool for a university and you've got, you know, you know, you're going to have teams as large as 40 people and, and you don't have enough lanes to accommodate that. So that's really a, a key, just kind of designing the wrong, the wrong pool is not enough deck, not enough storage, just yeah. a pool that's not functional. I think are the big, the big mistakes that I see. So I kind of have two hats on this because, you know, you and I were both competitive swimmers. So I, I kind of draw from my competitive swimming career, but mm -hmm. I also doing chloramine consulting and Orenda where we go in and help struggling pools get better air quality and water quality. I've been to a lot of bad pools, just like you have. One of my biggest pet peeves is dark pools. Lighting that gets blocked because it was put up before the mechanical contractors were able to put in the duct. And now you have a really well illuminated duct, but none of that light gets down to the ground. Yeah. That's yeah. really annoying. Absolutely. The best way to get light uh, over a pool is literally over the pool. But how do you change your bulbs? Uh, LED fixtures have made a big difference. You're not going to have to deal with them very often. Mm -hmm. But typically when you have lights over the water, that requires a catwalk mm -hmm. or some, some way to change it. And that's costly. So most pools have light just around the perimeter. Mm -hmm. and so it can be challenging to get the lighting levels that you need, especially out there in the middle of the pool. And it's also challenging to avoid shadows on the pool. Eric, what do you, what do you think in your days of swimming? What do you think about underwater lights? Have you swam in many pools that have underwater lights that are used in competition? 
I was actually yeah. about to ask you about underwater lights. Um, I don't mind them. I yeah. hate them when I'm looking right at them. So yeah. on the end walls of a competitive pool, I don't mm -hmm. like them. Yeah. Unless they're aimed down so I can see the bottom clearly. On the right. sides, I'm totally fine with it. Yeah. Um, but I only did it like in the summer league. What do you think of those lights that you only have to change the bulbs? They're over the deck, but then there's this tube of mirrors that goes across the pool. I've seen yeah. great results with that. Yeah, those are, the, the, those are commonly called light pipes. Um, they're very effective, and I think they're really attractive. And, um, they're quite costly, and, and they've been on a lot of my projects at the beginning, but as it gets a little later and uh, people are uh, realizing they're a little over budget, that's one of the first things that gets cut. Value engineering. Yeah, exactly. We should do another episode about value engineering again <laughs> because we could talk. <laughs> But you wouldn't be the only person I'd, I'd probably have 10 videos with 10 different experts yeah. about the pains of valuable elimination, I should say. Right. So uh, lighting is one of those. Drainage is another. If the deck is always soaked and it doesn't drain water well and get dry, it's a slip hazard and your feet get cold. You lose a lot of heat yeah. through your feet. So I'm a big advocate for trench drain and having the proper pitch. There's a slightly conflicting set of requirements on deck slope. Um, you know, you want an adequate slope to ensure proper drainage, but you can't exceed the ADA requirement for cross slope. So contractors got to be very good to get it between those, those two requirements. So you're, and it gets a lot. You're right. You end up with slippery decks because you have, you know, little bird baths everywhere. They're growing algae and, uh, and those problems. Oh yeah. We've definitely seen those. Uh, one of the other things uh, that I've noticed, this is only for pools that have competitive swimming. I should, I should yeah. outline that. But if the pool is deeper than say five feet, I think a tow ledge is a necessity and it should be tiled so you can clearly see it. It doesn't have to be recessed into the wall, just something to put your feet on because what swimmers do is yeah. on that wall, we have to listen to our coach. We have to get a set. We have to look at a clock. We have to grab our water. We have to change our equipment, grab our fins, whatever it is. And if you have nothing to put your feet on, it's all holding on to either the lane line or the wall. But if you had a toe ledge, all you need is just a yeah. finger on the wall to keep you there and all your weights on yeah. the toe. Some people probably don't have a clue what you're talking about because they none, never swam in an all deep pool. Toe ledges are essential for all deep pools. But let's, let's look at a typical high school pool, Eric. It's got one end where the diving board is and that's 12 feet deep. And the other end, uh, four. yeah. It's like about four feet deep, yeah. And, and you know where every coach runs practice from? The shallow end. And that's because the athletes can stand up. Mm -hmm. And but, but when we do deep pools that are, you know, both ends of the pool are deep, those athletes are treading water, they're sitting on the lane lines, they're hanging on the lane lines, and, and there it's not as effective. So, and another thing, when you're in the water that's this deep, your lungs have pressure on them. Mm -hmm. and, you, and, and if you can stand up, next your lungs are out of the water and they yes. don't have pressure so you can recover quicker between swims if you can stand up mm -hmm. so what you're referring to is a toe ledge that allows you to basically stand up on a pool that's too deep to stand up as a coach i've coached in all deep pools and i've coached in pools with shallow ends and for training i much prefer having a shallow end but yeah well there's a limit to how shallow because we trained at one pool is about three feet and yeah. For guys my size, that's a really difficult thing to do a flip turn and a breaststroke yeah. pull out and all this stuff. But we had to learn, man. You, you had to learn. You swim at the surface. You have to tuck tight. Um, so I guess it made me a better swimmer. But at the same time, I had enough scars from my yeah. hands hitting the bottom and my, I scraped my spine on the back. Oh, it was. So I'm going to throw a wild a uh, curveball at you that we did not prepare this question. I'm just going to ask you and see how you react. Steve, I'm going to give you. $2 million and you need to build the most practical pool that has a swim team, swim lessons, and general recreation for the community. What do you build? For the pool, not a $2 million natatorium. No, just the pool. There's really not much, not such thing. <laughs> okay. The pool would probably be a, either a 25 yard by 25 meter pool. I think it's critical to be able to run both of those courses mm -hmm. over the life of that pool. You know, that pool's going to last 50 years. And over life, 25 meters could become the preferred distance. Okay. Also, I'm a big fan of the stretch 25 pool. The stretch pool does you, it's, it's about 120 feet long. And it, it, it allows swimming and diving to take place in the same body of water separated by a bulkhead. 
Is this like a stretch 33, like a 30 yeah. third meter pool? Yeah, exactly. You could move the bulkhead to the end and have about a 30, 33 meter pool. But the beauty of that pool is, is, is this during like a high school meet, for example, mm -hmm. you've got swimming and diving taking place in the same body of water, but, but really in their own area. So the, the meets run very quickly. The divers can do their meet warm ups while the swimmers are having their events going on. Um, in this case, the swimmers would start from an oversized bulkhead and they would turn at the shallow end. Okay. The divers, meanwhile, are behind them. But that's a dual meet scenario. But if you if you're running a championship meet, mm -hmm. what you could do is you could move that bulkhead toward the deep end and you could run an all deep course. So that gives you the luxury of great water polo condition. You got an all deep water polo. Mm -hmm. You have deep swimming and during that mode the leftover part of the pool that was your diving well is now your warm-up pool so in that configuration you've got not a diving well and a swimming pool you've got a swimming pool and a warm-up pool or a swimming pool and a lessons pool and that separation in my opinion gives you really good safety for a pool that has community use because you really have a shallow water pool yeah. So shallow, Very four versatile. feet, three and a half. What yeah. are you thinking? Four feet. All right. So what type of filter would you put on the pool? Um, not brand specific. So, yeah. you know, DE, you do pressure yeah. sand, vacuum sand. What would you do? It depends on what the motivation is. If, if you want to be um, environmentally conscious, probably want to look at a filter that does not discharge a lot of water to the sewer. And that's where generative media filters have become so popular because they save a lot of, a lot of water, um, mm -hmm compared to a, a high rate sand filter for, you know, for backwashing. Uh, from a performance standpoint, I don't think there's a big difference. Um, you know, when, when you're a swimmer, it's not critical that, you, you know, that the water be so clear that you can see 50 meters like you're looking through air. Uh, yeah. But for, for, big, for big competitions and for doing a lot of underwater video work, those, those uh, regenerative media filters and some of the more yeah, high- nice filters make a big difference and I can I can watch a swim meet on, on television a lot of times Eric and almost tell what kind of filter is on that pool based on how well you can see the swimmer you know 10 lanes away. Are you in favor of slightly upsizing equipment in a pump room and spending the extra money on the better controller and minimizing other things to make sure that it all fits within a budget or do you just go with the minimum? You know, we never like to design anything to, to the bare minimum, you know, like uh, for, if, if the code says you can circulate this pool every six hours, we're going to typically do it every five or five and a half, just because over time we don't want, we never want to get in a situation where we're not meeting the minimum. Right. Uh, same thing would be in a diving well. If we're designing a pool and the, the minimum depth for the diving board is 12 feet, we're going to typically design it at 12 and 12 and a half feet because of there is not perfect typically and many times you know things can get missed by a little bit so we like to have a little bit of a little bit of wiggle room and i think for for um i think many codes are inadequate in terms of of how how uh the circulation rate that they would like to see on pools so we we commonly upgrade the circulation and the filtration rate significantly especially with with pools that are going to be high 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 use like a lot of the, the outdoor leisure pools right Right on. Well, last question on that is to what degree do you automate this pool? Do you have a chlorine feeder that's automated? Do you have ORP? What, what else do you automate on it? You know, we, we like to, we think it's important that the pool um, operator be engaged frequently. Uh, we don't want them just uh, checking, checking everything on their phone, you know, every day. And we want them in that mechanical room uh, on a frequent basis. You know, typically, we, we, we rarely do filters that will backwash themselves at, in, at midnight when no one's at the, at the facility. We typically like to have the operator there to oversee things, and make sure that, uh, you know, you don't, have, you don't have an issue. There are exceptions to that. And we, we really, uh, in terms of the level of automation, we, we have a lot of conversations with the operator and, 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 and we use their guidance a lot in terms of what, what they're, what they're comfortable with, what they've done in the past, and what they want going forward. So it's, it's their facility, and we try to design a facility they're comfortable with. Right on. Well, you heard it here first from Steve himself. If that were his pool, it would be a very functional pool with a movable bulkhead that could do mm -hmm. both swimming and diving and potentially water polo. 
and the big one, which is the actual revenue earner, which is swim lessons. And so Steve. Recreation. I'm a big believer yeah. that, that just because you have a big rectangle doesn't mean that the pool can't, uh, can't be fun. There's a, so many cool, cool features out there to, to make to make a big rectangular pool just as just as fun as a as a free form you know outdoor uh, oh yeah water. now i one question i didn't ask i assume this is a gutter pool not a skimmer pool yeah absolutely absolutely any, any sort of pool used for competition would be a gutter pool for for sure and that's because that that ensures that the water is is calm at the surface if a pool is a skimmer pool any any wave that hits the perimeter bounces right back into the field of play even Eric, even a pool that's used for like water aerobics, uh, our preference by far would be to have a gutter pool because you get, you get 30 people bouncing up and down. Oh yeah. It, that, that pool can get really, really wavy and, and uncomfortable. Yeah. The gutters eat that. So yeah. Awesome. Well, Steve, again, thank you for joining me. This has been Steve Crocker from water tech, um, water technology. It's, I think it's WTIworld.com. Yes. Check out their portfolio. They do some really cool stuff all over the world. Great designer, even better swimmer. And he was our expert today when it comes to what mistakes to avoid when you are designing or building a new swimming pool. I'm Eric Knight, your host. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, take care. Thanks, Eric.